All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone joining us. We are going to start in about one minute. So thank you for uh, being prompt. And uh, we want to reward you by starting on time. So we're just going to give people maybe one more minute. Um, as you see, this is being recorded. So just to let you know, you have to approve um, uh, being recorded. So I see we are at uh, 12 o'clock exactly right now. Just going to give it one more moment as people are coming in. And we're glad to welcome you to the Snapshots Lecture. Hello, everybody. So just to say that we are using a traditional uh, Zoom webinar format and um, uh, excuse me, a regular format instead of a webinar format today. This allows us to have a good Q&A time together. Um, so I'm just going to recommend some housekeeping items that uh, you know you may want to choose speaker view uh, because otherwise you're gonna you're gonna see a lot of people's uh, images on here. So you can pick speaker view and then you can focus on the uh, the presentation today. Also, uh, we ask you to remain muted for this portion. We will be able to unmute at the Q&A section um, at the end of the presentation. You can also take your camera off during the presentation, but if you wanna ask a question, we love to see you if you wanna turn your camera back on. Uh, if you are having any trouble connecting, uh, you know, you, you, if you can, you can use the chat. We'll try to help you out. Uh, or you can try connecting on your phone as well um, because we want you to participate. So we're glad to have so many people on. We will have a few more joining us, but I want to, us to be timely and to give you a warm welcome on behalf of everybody at Landmarks Illinois. We're so glad to have you here for the Snapshots Lecture Series. And I'm Bonnie McDonald. I am the uh, President and CEO of Landmarks Illinois, and also proud to be today's speaker about uh, how we are guiding preservation forward at Landmarks Illinois. So let me get our presentation started here. If you give me just a moment, we're going to do a quick check uh, to make sure you are seeing the, the presentation correctly. So I'm just going to do a quick check. Thank you, Frank, very much. Um, so everyone, uh, I would very much like to, to thank Landmarks Illinois members and supporters. Um, you make our impact possible, including our ability to present information and to do the work of that I'm going to talk about today. If you are not a member of Landmarks Illinois, I hope that you're, you're excited and compelled by the work that you see today and that you will join us as a member or as a supporter. Um, we, again, just for a reminder, we're going to ask everybody to remain muted during the presentation and then in the Q&A you can take yourself off and ask questions or throughout the presentation you can use the chat feature to ask questions and Frank Butterfield, our Chief Operating Officer, is going to monitor those questions and send them to me at the end of the presentation. Um, if this is your first time meeting us at Landmarks Illinois, again, warm welcome. And we are the statewide historic preservation nonprofit organization. Um, our work is to help people save places for people. And we do that through um, advocacy, education, providing uh, technical assistance, resources like grants and our new loan program as well. So we're a multifaceted organization. And today's presentation is about how we aim to do that work even better in the future. But first, I do like to give you a teaser about uh, what to put on your calendar next. Uh, so Landmarks Illinois is so proud to have partnered with the Richard H. Driehaus Foundation uh, for the last 28 years, uh, presenting our annual Landmarks Illinois Richard H. Driehaus Foundation Preservation Awards Program. That is coming up on Friday, October 22nd, and it's uh, both an in-person and a virtual experience. So we would love to see you in person at the Davis Theater. You can get more information about this at our website, landmarks.org. It's at the bottom of all the slides, so you'll be able to see it and put it into your browser. Um, we hope that you will join us for this feel-good event. Our, everybody who comes every year, we hear that this is one of their favorite events of the year in preservation because uh, they leave just understanding the impact of this work in so many communities across the state. So I hope you'll join us. It's the evening again of Friday, October 22nd, and you're going to see nine award winners, including what you see on the screen right now. 
This is the uh, Cristo Reyes St. Martin College Prep um, uh, School in Waukegan. It is receiving an award this year for its transformation of what was formerly a Kmart store into a state-of-the-art education center. And you'll learn how that, um, how that happened at the awards, but also we're pleased to present a, a focused discussion about this at our next Snapshots lecture. So you can see that is taking place on November 3rd, once again at noon, so you can spend your lunch hour with us. And we'll have a, a Juan Gabriel Moreno, who is the architect of this project from JGMA, uh, as well as the, uh, Preston Kendall, who is the, uh, the president or the principal at the school, and some student ambassadors from the school to talk about what this means to them and, and how transforming this prior vacant big box store into this school is helping to transform this part of Waukegan as well. So I hope that you'll, you'll join us. And um, speaking of, you know, the, this, uh, this project, you might see a big box preservation and say, how is that related to ideas about historic preservation? And that is the entire premise for today's presentation and the work that we've done at Landmarks Illinois around our guiding principles. It is to push the idea of preservation into a new realm. You know, what preservation means, who is involved, who makes decisions about what is preserved and how we do that very work. Now, we started that process um, in conjunction with our 50th anniversary. So Landmarks Illinois turned 50 years old this year, and we've been celebrating uh, and planning for this for a couple years at this point. And when we thought about what we wanted to do for our 50th anniversary, you know, we had options before us, like uh, doing a, uh, you know, a book or a documentary, for example, um, you know, having a big celebration, as many would. But the, the direction that we decided to go in, in spending the resources on our anniversary was to think forward. You know, how were we going to evolve as an organization for the next 50 years of our history? How would we ensure that Landmarks Illinois continued to provide the resources that people needed 50 years into the future um, to be a resource to them? What would preservation look like to people in 5, 10, 25 years? And how could we prepare ourselves now to be the organization that they might need or ensure the resources are that, there for them in the future? Um, we, uh, we wanted to do that thinking about the opportunities around preservation. You know, what were the challenges that we were seeing and how would we address those challenges going forward? So I'm gonna you know, just state a few of them, but they'll be on a slide in, in just a moment if you would like to, to have um, more context. But for example, the, the photo that I'm showing you here is a project that we've been working on for several years. This is the historic Rock Island County Courthouse in uh, Rock Island, Illinois. And here we've been involved in a regulatory process using the state's uh, historic preservation law um, and through section 707 of the Illinois Historic Preservation Sites Act. And we've been trying to protect this courthouse as it's been promote, proposed for demolition after what you see to the right um, was built, which is their new courthouse. Uh, so here we've just um, unfortunately seen the local government, the county government, uh, not supporting preservation whatsoever, seeing this as a disposable building. And that is, um, that is not relegated to just Rock Island. Unfortunately, we see that in many communities across the state. We've seen historic preservation ordinances being challenged, um, designations overturned by village boards or city councils. Uh, several years ago, our State Historic Preservation Office uh, was moved to a different department and, uh, you know, the staff was, um, was not, the positions were not being filled. That also happened in, in my home state of Minnesota, uh, where we're seeing SHPO offices decrease or being moved into other departments. In 2017, during tax reform policy at the federal government, the federal historic tax credit was threatened. So these are the things that we were seeing as obstacles, unfortunately, or challenges in preservation. Um, so we wanted to look at those as um, opportunities for the future. So I'm putting before you a list of things that we have consistently heard from our our local communities, um, from those we talk to at the, at the federal level, uh, and also our partners all across the country. Because as we approached this idea of what does a preservation organization need to be for the future, we did wanna talk with our other colleagues across the country to see were they seeing the same things that we were. 
And indeed, these are the themes that came out of those conversations. Um, I'm gonna put this slide up at the very end, so don't worry, you're not gonna miss it. And this presentation, you'll be able to see it once again on our YouTube page if you do happen to miss something, because we have a lot to cover today. So what we decided to do as a process was to form a think tank. And thankfully, we had an incredible number of volunteers come forward to help us think about the future of preservation and Landmarks Illinois. So to all of those pictures here, I would like to thank you for those who have joined us on today's, uh, today's presentation for all of the time that you put into this process of rethinking preservation. You know, who are those folks that you just saw? They fall into these categories of skill sets we thought it would be important to bring people to the table who are not only traditional preservationists who might have been in preservation for years, have a preservation degree, be advocates, uh, but we also wanted those who we consider accidental preservationists. Our own board chair, Sandra Rand, who's with us today, would call herself an accidental preservationist. She owns a historic home, loves her home, loves the work that they've done to it, um, and, and has been brought into preservation that way. We also wanted to invite those who have seen and been critical of what preservation has or has not done in a community. And they may be called disruptors, if you call it that, who are people who are thinking critically about what this field needs to be to move forward. Um, so we also wanted to ensure emerging leaders in preservation were involved because this is the future we're designing and they are part of today as well as um, they will be running preservation in the future. So we brought together over 30 people for conversations from December 2019 until we approved the guiding principles we'll talk about in April of 2021. I'm putting this process before you. It's a, a lot of words on a page. I promise I have some great images to show you. But I thought we have people joining us from other preservation organizations, and I thought you would want to see how we led this process. It was essentially a series of meetings um, that happened pre-COVID and during COVID. So these were in-person as well as um, virtual conversations, but people were able to engage very deeply in conversations about equity, uh, about the evolution of preservation from the perspective of inclusion and diversity, thinking about what our role needs to be in the conversation around housing all across the state in urban and rural communities. You know, thinking about justice and preservation and how people access preservation regulation and incentives. So this, the, these uh, communications were uh, topical. Each of these conversations had one topic so we could really focus in on what we saw were what we were doing right and what preservation was doing wrong. Um, so just to say, I, I hope this is helpful to you. And at the end, we have a Q&A where I can answer more questions about each one of these topics. The outcome, uh, as you saw, we approved through the board of directors our guiding principles. What do we mean by guiding principles? You know, this started as a conversation about designing uh, essentially a manifesto for preservation. What was our new philosophy going to be? Uh, but with some of the pejorative nature of the word manifesto, we decided to change it to guiding principles. And essentially the guiding principles are, we see it as our code of conduct. How this organization is going to look through the lens of these guiding principles to evaluate what we're doing going forward. You know, so they're not quite values. We already have a set of values as an organization, but how do we implement those values through this code of conduct? So I'm laying out for you in the rest of the presentation, uh, essentially a very deep dive into these guiding principles. They are one entire document and Frank Butterfield, our chief operating officer is gonna drop into the chat if he hasn't already, the link to our website where you can access the entire document. Uh, Caitlin McAvoy, our communications manager has excerpted them into the um, about us page, but then you can click on a PDF to get the entire document. So that's what I'm gonna talk about today. And a key part of that is our preamble. The preamble is to really understand the context of why we came into doing this. And I've given you essentially the shorthand of what we sought out to do. We saw that preservation is, is not seen for, for good reason as a diverse, accessible, inclusive, and just practice. Uh, so we seek out to make it that, even though it has not been so. And we wanna take accountability for what our organization has not done or has done in the past and, and try to improve on this work. We don't have all the answers, but we see this as a really important starting point. 
we also wanted to redefine what we saw as preservation. What could it be in, in the new scope of um, being more relevant to a larger group of people? And what we saw is that you know, this uh, part of being um, uh, transparent and accountable and inclusive is telling difficult stories at the same time as preserving places that are about people's identity. Um, we talk about our work as people saving places for people, and that's still uh, principles to our work, that we work side by side um, with communities. And so we felt it was important to say we work with people as well. Um, so this is laying the groundwork for that important work going forward. Here are the five principles that we came up with, and then there are a set of points that go with each one of them. So I'm going to go through them in detail today. So you'll see them again and again, but I wanted you to get a scope of essentially the entire aspect of the document, which is five leading principles. Uh, essentially, we are going to fight for and model justice, equity, inclusion, diversity and accessibility, um, confront climate change through our work because these two, number one and number two, um, were the, uh, I think, the, the preeminent conversations that were coming forward nationally, locally, um, as well as at the statewide level. And we see the practice of this. How do we do this in practice? Really, numbers three, four, and five are about the practice of how we are going to do this work. So let's get into those in particular. I'm going to start with number one and say within each one of these there are bullet points about how we're going to do this work. And I would uh, like to pick a few of these to illustrate. So the first bullet point really acknowledges the important role, uh, the important presence of our Native American community. And they're often uh, not, not talked about or not considered in the work of advocacy organizations. Um, our state historic preservation offices are often working with our tribal representatives through um, the Native American Graves Repatriation Act, for example, or consultation with our tribal historic preservation offices. But within advocacy, uh, they're often not consulted and, and our Native American community is still here with us. Um, so here's one example of the start of this. You know, to, to be in consultation with, to be in community with, our Native American communities is to recognize that they're still here with us. Um, this is a piece of artwork designed by an Anishinaabe artist, uh, Andrea Carlson here in Chicago. It's right on the Chicago riverfront. And it's just a, a, um, it's a symbol uh, to, to make people know that they are on Potawatomi land uh, when they're here standing in Chicago. It's just um, really recognizing that the Potawatomi people are still here and this is still their land. So this is a starting point, it's just recognition um, that our Native American community is still here and that we have the, the opportunity and the responsibility to consult with, build relationships with, um, and understand uh, their voice in preservation. It goes beyond uh, talking about uh, land acknowledgements, it's really about building relationships. Our second point is to respect people's identities. Respect is principle to having an understanding of people's stories and their connections to place. Um, so we would like to ensure that we are being respectful of the diversity of the differences uh, within preservation. And one illustration, which I, I think um, was um, key that Julie Carpenter, our programs manager brought forward is actually from this year's preservation awards, our Landmarks Illinois Richard H. Driehaus Foundation Preservation Awards is giving an award to Nauvoo, which is associated with the Church of, Latter -day, uh, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And in Nauvoo, um, this is really reflective of the uh, pursuit of religious freedom. And here there was a deep level of research to understand the, the community here and how they were pursuing religious freedom um, and that there are diversity of opinions about, um, of course, religion and practice of religion in, in the United States. Um, and also talking about the relationships that the, the, um, um, that the Mormons uh, had with the Native American community also in this space. Our third bullet point is to identify and eliminate barriers to engagement. What is preventing, preventing people from feeling that preservation represents them or where they feel welcome um, in this environment? And here, I, I do not have a specific illustration, but I can say that um, so far we've worked uh, very hard to ensure that our board of directors, this is an important place to start with our board of directors and our staff, 
uh, is a place where people feel welcome, where they see themselves. And, and we are proud uh, to have Sandra Rand as our board chair, you know, a, a woman leading an organization, an African-American woman leading our organization, uh, and the first, the first African-American woman in 50 years uh, to lead our organization, which is far too long uh, to wait for leadership. Um, but that leadership provides a welcoming environment for others who see themselves in our board of directors. Um, we also wanted to eliminate barriers, uh, sometimes financial barriers, to engaging in our programs. I know we've heard this from some of our Skyline Council members. Our Skyline Council is our emerging leaders organization, and uh, there are times they, they can't afford to come to the programs that Landmarks Illinois has. Sometimes our ticket prices are $50, $60, some $500 in the past. So when we looked at our 50th anniversary event, we, uh, we made sure it was pay what you can, which was um, if paying what you can is zero, you, you are welcome. We welcomed everybody to this virtual event and we're using it as a springboard to think about how our events are going to be priced or not priced in the future. The snapshots lecture, for example, trying to find a sponsor so that we can make it free to everybody in the future. And then considering some of those higher ticket price events, how do we make room so that everybody can participate? Uh, we want to create that welcoming environment. As I said, it's, it starts with the board and the staff, but also um, having the presence um, you know, of people feeling seen at our events, making sure their voice is heard, and that our partners are, we're putting them forward and amplifying their voices as well and what we're doing. And I'll have some illustrations of that in a moment, because it connects to our work also. Point five is to combat racism through our work. Um, identify where preservation has been uh, a part of uh, systemic racism, where it has been complicit, and where we can fight to ensure that we're telling the true stories of history, telling the full American story, um, and also ensuring that our work is not promoting these systems, but uh, dismantling these systems. Um, I, I put forward a, an example where we're working right now with our partners Route History Incorporated in Springfield to ensure that sites uh, associated with the Green Book are preserved. Um, of the sites that we were able to document from the Green Book from 1937 to its uh, final publication in the late 1960s, um, there were roughly 250 properties and of those only about 15% still exist from what we can see. So their preservation to tell this important story is paramount, um, but understanding and ensuring that we know this history is an important first step. Our next uh, guiding principle is to confront climate change and promote environmental justice. Uh, one of the, the, you know, the critical, um, you know, the critical calamities that are facing the human race, of course, is climate change. So how can we ensure that our work is recognized as part of confronting climate change through our sustainable practices? Preservation is the original green, as we like to talk about. But then how can we go forward to see the human side and promote environmental justice at the same time? The first step for us is becoming more knowledgeable in this work. And uh, to do that, we've invited uh, knowledgeable people to come to our board of directors, including Mike Jackson uh, from Springfield, Illinois, who was one of the leading voices around um, preservation and sustainability going back two decades at this point, and uh, welcoming Evan Yond, who has been an environmental designer and understands uh, sustainable approaches at a policy level onto the board. So having that board leadership to understand um, uh, what our work needs to look like. Um, prioritizing projects where we can actually um, show the, you know, the, the impact of climate change and um, prioritizing communities that have unfortunately been um, principal um, recipients of pollutants. One of those in Chicago is Altgelt Gardens, uh, where there's a um, high degree of uh, cancer from pollution um, in this uh, particular Calumet area of the city of Chicago. And, and here we've partnered with People for Community Recovery, the organization that actually really started the environmental justice movement, Hazel Johnson being the mother of environmental justice, and uh, putting these uh, properties on our most endangered historic places list um, in community with uh, People for Community Recovery and residents of Altgelt Gardens to ensure that uh, we are telling the story through, through place and also protecting the places that the community feels are important. 
Um, and finally, embracing new technology. So, you know, how do we how do we wade through some of the complexities of preservation, um, our own design guidelines and requirements uh, for integrity? Uh, Secretary of the Interior standards, as many of you know, um, would um, you know have us consider the location of solar panels. For example, we just had a conversation with Suzanne German, our director of reinvestment, about landmarks in Illinois easement program and and how we can find guidelines to ensure that. Um, uh, technology like solar panels can be can be incorporated and welcomed. This is one of our past award winners uh, that had used photovoltaics on the roof, um, although they really can't be seen from the ground level. Um, so just an example of one project that used it very successfully. Uh, our third principle is building lasting and positive relationships, and, and that is part of being relevant in people's lives is, is not to be extractive in nature, you know, not to take resources or to take credit for the preservation work that people are doing in their community, but instead to be a contributor and to be a positive uh, partner to those working already in preservation and to help those who want to get into preservation and understand it better. You know, these positive relationships are only by um, satisfying mutual goals, understanding our partner's goals deeply, uh, listening in the process, and then finding ways to, uh, to work and help our partners uh, achieve what they are seeking for their community. Um, to do that as well, we need to invest our resources freely. Uh, we believe that that includes many kinds of resources, our, our knowledge, our grant funds, uh, as well as our relationships with people such as grantors. Um, how do we make a direct connection so that Landmarks Illinois is not a gatekeeper to resources? Um, one example of this is, is our work with Chandra Cooper and um, the owners of the Muddy Waters. This is the, the Muddy Waters Mojo Museum in Chicago, uh, where Lisa DiChiara, our director of advocacy, has worked very hard to, um, to help find, adopt a landmark funding. That's one program here in Chicago that will make, uh, hopefully make resources available um, directly to the site so that it's not coming through Landmarks Illinois. And we've been proud to start a new grant fund that Suzanne German administers our Timuel Black Junior Grant Fund for Chicago South Side. Timuel was one of our honorees. And in honor of um, his sacred ground, as he called it, which is the uh, South Side of Chicago, uh, to take resources from our events and uh, distribute them as grants into the community that he calls home. And that was important to him. So the Muddy Waters Museum was the first recipient of the Timiel Black Grant. Those are two examples, but we're doing more to also make relationships available and to add our administrative and nonprofit um, expertise and resources to help this uh, organization. We also want communities to decide for themselves what they care about. Um, this has been a practice in preservation to go, especially in survey work, windshield surveys, and look at, uh, you know, drive through a neighborhood and pick what we think is important. It is so vital to have a conversation with a community about what what they see as important, you know, not to make an us versus them at all. I use the word they to just respect that, uh, you know, that we do not live in the community, um, but working together to ask what is important and how is there a way we can help you save what is important to you. Um, it's that self-determination that is really important going forward. Um, Crystal Ray being one of those, you know, some may question why is this getting a preservation award, a, a former Kmart store, but honestly, the, the community saw this as a valuable piece of property where they could put a school there quickly and it was much cheaper than building a new building. Um, so we see this as the emblematic of the future where, where no building is seen as disposable uh, and where they all have value as potential reuse opportunities. Uh, our principle number four is, is to identify, share, and reinforce on stories of people's intersection with place. You know, the National Trust for Historic Preservation has uh, really, you know, launched, uh, you might see the hashtag, tell the full story through their African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund, doing an exceptional job of ensuring that uh, places associated with African American history are receiving resources and that the history is being told um, at a time when we, we need to prioritize racial justice. Uh, history is vital to understanding, um, understanding the history and experience. 
So we do need to work in permission with people though. So this is a concept that our think tank thought was very important. Uh, just because we have access to people's stories and resources does, doesn't mean we have a right to them. Uh, it doesn't mean that our advocacy organizations are entitled to do something with that information. There should be, with respect to people's beliefs and identities and community, um, a, a, a request if we are well, wanted, welcome, and how we can participate. Uh, that includes engaging in consensus building. And this is where sometimes these guiding principles are gonna possibly be in conflict with each other. So um, how do you build consensus when people think different things in communities? Who, who is the consensus? Who is the community that you look to? And, and here I would say we don't have all the answers yet. And this is an iterative, iterative process where we're gonna learn how to do this work that we seek out. How do we put this code of conduct into practice and learn how to do it better over time? Um, but consensus building is, is trying to find that community around a place and ensure that there is the community support um, in, in moving forward with its preservation. And amplifying community voices as well. So this is really about you know, that respect for what people feel is important in their community, the places they identify with, and ensuring that they're in, you know, they're in the front seat, they're in the driver's seat, uh, and that we're providing the resources as they need them and request them, um, working in community with that. And that oftentimes uh, we're going to find in the process of exploring as we tell and reinforce honest stories, very difficult histories as well. Um, and that we need to reveal those truths uh, to again, be honest and ensure that our work is prioritizing and fighting racism, uh, that we are prioritizing diversity, inclusion, accessibility, uh, justice and equity. So one example of that is the work we did in community with uh, the uh, chapter of the NAACP in Springfield and other organizations to prioritize the preservation of the 1908 race riot site in Springfield, um, which is it's still a place of, um, you know, of great uh, sorrow, of horror, um, where, you know, this murder was perpetrated in the African American community um, and acts of terrorism against the African American community community in Springfield. Um, this site where you see behind you is what, is, what remains of the 1908 race riot site is an, is an archaeological site at this point. And um, to the back of this picture, you will see train tracks. Uh, this is where the Amtrak high-speed rail is going, and it was going to unfortunately go right over the race riot site. And the community came together to say, um, of course, no, that, that is not acceptable. This should be a nationally significant site uh, because it actually led to the creation of the national NAACP. Um, so together, working in community and, and ensuring that you know, our voice was, was additive to and amplifying the, the voices of um, the NAACP, uh, the local Urban League chapter, for example, uh, we were able to collaboratively ensure that the Amtrak is, um, is avoiding the, the main portion of the site. You know, finally, uh, number five is to be fully transparent and accountable. We felt like to do this work, uh, we need to lay open, you know, open the curtains and identify where we're struggling, where we're learning things, uh, and to be transparent about uh, how we're doing this work. Uh, so that has to begin with being accountable to our own organizational history. We just did a deep dive into our 50th anniversary history um, and, uh, you know, to talk about that work um, and to be accountable to it, we're, we're still learning learning how we're going to bring that history forward and make it transparent for people. Um, and transparency means open access. So this is where our website is going to play a key role in the future. And we need to continue to add capacity to um, ensure that our website um, has the space and we have the time and we have the people power to add more to it uh, so that it's also accessible to anybody at any time. Uh, this is one example of where we're, we're, um, we're both happy and struggling with an outcome of one of our um, advocacy uh, initiatives. So the Colonel Wolf School is in Champaign. Um, it was uh, headed for the landfill. It was, again, seen as a, a, a building that was, uh, had no use to the, the, the school district that owned it. Um, and unfortunately, you know, the, 
it took a, it took a great deal of advocacy to demonstrate how this was a reusable building. Um, if we are successful in making preservation relevant, hopefully we won't have to make that argument in the future. Uh, but we worked together with our board member, Gary Anderson of GWA Studio in Rockford, as well as our local advocates um, at, uh, at PACA to ensure that we um, convinced the, the owner that this was reusable. And it is moving forward now with a developer who plans to use it for market rate housing. And that was our quandary is that we saw this, uh, this place, which is honoring, um, I should say, excuse me, it's, it's special because it's honoring um, the first registered African-American architect in the uh, state of Illinois. It was um, designed by him, Walter Bailey, and he was also the first African-American graduate of the University of Illinois architecture program. So um, this was a significant site for ensuring we are telling African-American history in Illinois as well. Um, but with market rate housing, we were, were asking ourselves, is that the best use for it? Um, that's the use that we have. And so we're continuing to move forward. We see this, you know, uh, of course, as a sustainable project. Uh, but could it have been used to um, also meet other principles like providing, uh, you know, providing accessible, affordable housing? Um, and we haven't come to terms with what, what that means for preservation or our organization yet. So just laying bare that, that we still have many questions to answer in applying these principles. Uh, we, we want to ensure that we're accountable to the guiding principles, which this uh, presentation is part of that. We have to talk about them. We have to promote them and ensure that people can uh, respond to us when we, they don't feel like we've met our own principles. Um, so that accountability and transparency is, um, is going to be, uh, I, I think, key to their being successful in the future and us making transformational change in our organization and hopefully in the preservation field as well. Um, one way I just want to say that I'm so proud of our team, uh, Caitlin McAvoy, our, our advocacy team, Lisa DiChiara, Suzanne German, Frank Butterfield, um, come together every year to create our state of preservation map. So in our newsletter, uh, and then it goes on the website later, we put down on paper in a map, you can see where we have been in a particular year. We are a statewide organization. And you can see where the holes are, if, despite trying very hard to reach certain parts of the state, um, it can be very difficult for us um, with you know, limited capacity, limited partnership in those communities. So we have our, a number of board members who I think very, um, uh, you know, honestly tell us and have every, you know, every um, right to say, uh, and it's very valid that we don't do enough in Southern Illinois, and that is an area of improvement for us. So we have to be accountable to that and uh, look to make change to make sure our resources are distributed equitably as well. Um, so those are the, the guiding principles. I just want to say the rest of the document, if you take a look at it, we did include definitions of what we meant by these terms. It's very important for people to know uh, what we mean by them, because you might have a different definition than we do. So we did include that, as well as where to find more resources, uh, because not everyone has the, you know, has the same starting point for their understanding of concepts like racism and white privilege and climate change. So we, we did have uh, links to other resources as well. So that is all part of this document. And we, um, we wanted you know, to take our steps forward in implementing these and have something to report to you. So this was improved in April, but our team has already been implementing this work um, and, and gotten started. And I'm so proud and, and thankful that they're excited about implementing the guiding principles. So some of the things that we've done already would be looking at our hiring practices and what we need to do um, in our recruiting measurements, uh, in what we put in job descriptions, listing salaries, in our job descriptions, um, honoring Sarah Marsum's work in that area, um, to, to try to add more diversity, add more perspectives to our staff. Uh, we're doing what's called a spend diagnostic, which is looking at the money that we spend on our contractors and vendors. How many of those contractors and vendors are women business ownership and minority business ownership? And how can we increase that to increase the, um, the equitable uh, allocation of our resources? Um, and we're moving forward with creating infrastructure to bring our, our staff and our board together to continue pursuing um, this work through a, a collaborative yet to be named um, committee, essentially, which will focus on equity and diversity and anti-racism work. 
looking at things like our, the language that we use, our hiring practices, as you see here. And they'll be working with a further a DEI consultant, diversity, equity, inclusion consultant. We already have done training with this um, in the past, but we need to continue that training. That's key. That continue just has to, has to keep going, um, the training uh, to understand uh, the work that we need to continue to do to advance um, these principles and evolve ourselves. We're also hiring a communications consultant to better understand the language that we need to use that's that's more accessible to people and also more relevant in talking about the work um, and listening and hearing back from uh, constituencies who may not feel that they're uh, represented in preservation as well. So this will all go into a later strate strategic plan, which is coming up uh, starting next spring, and we're happy to share that with you as we finish it um, toward 2023. Um, and as we continue to expand our staff, you're going to continue to see us invest in our communications and advocacy teams, because that is the work that we do and sharing it uh, is vital to ensuring a relevant future for not only Landmarks Illinois, but for advocacy and preservation in Illinois. Um, we want to promote these principles and share them with you and everybody uh, across, you know, across our state, across the country, uh, because we're proud of them and, and want to be accountable to them. Uh, and finally, the, the work I have done um, uh, as part of a fellowship from the James Marston Fitch Charitable Foundation, some of you know uh, that this has contributed to this um, uh, prospect uh, you know, of, of education, that we're making sure we're doing this correctly, that we're, we're, we're representing what's happening around the country. Um, I want to thank the 130 people that I've talked to so far who have um, uh, really reinforced what we were hearing and what we were thinking. So this again is that slide coming back to you. You can see it again. These are the common points from these 130 interviews and the ideas that we had through this think tank are going to come forward in uh, what's essentially called the relevancy guidebook, uh, which will be published under Landmarks Illinois on our website. So, you know, to, to close and get to our Q&A as soon as possible, because I hope you have lots of questions about this work, I, I thought you may have these questions in particular, so I, maybe we can tick these off uh, and you can ask a deeper level of question from them. Uh, where can you find them? Once again, Frank has posted the link to our website on our About Us page. Uh, so you can find the, the, the five principles and then you can link to the document and open it up to get the preamble, the definitions and the additional bullet points. Um, and feel free to, to share them, use them, you know, criti criticize them, whatever you need to do, want to do. We really want to have an engagement and a discussion around them. How long are these intended to last? So I know somebody asked that of me, you know, is this, is this basically for a year? Uh, you know, is this gonna be part of the strategic plan? You know, the, the intent for the guiding principles is that they will be iterative, that as we learn, we will go back and reevaluate them. Uh, so an evolving organization needs to continually go back to question, uh, evaluate and improve what it has. As our Sandra Rand, our chair, always says, we are a continuous improvement organization. Uh, so we, we want to continue to improve these guiding principles as well, based on what we learn. Um, how long will it take to implement them? Personally, I do not think there's ever a done. Uh, you know, we, we, this is not checking a box. Um, you know, we're not here to just do the required. Uh, this is intentional growth and evolution, and that is going to take not only time, uh, but I don't think there's an end point to it to be, you know, truly um, authentic about that work. Uh, who will be involved in their implementation? Well, you've already heard about the work of our board of directors or, you know, our volunteers and committee members, our entire team of staff, uh, but it also involves you, you know, our stakeholders, our, our members, donors, um, those engaged in social media with us, our advocates, um, those who would be critics of this as well. It's really to involve everyone in this transformation that needs to happen in historic preservation as we see it. So I hope that you will continue to interrogate these with us uh, to, to ensure we're accountable. And you can do that through social media. Uh, you, can, you can email. I'll have my contact information. It's on our website as well. We truly want you to engage. Um, and how can you use them? That's up to you, but we invite you to use them. We invite you to bring them to, you know, to the table, whatever tables you're, you're sitting at and consider if they can be helpful to you. Uh, we, we see this as a resource and Landmarks Illinois wants to freely share our resources. That's one of our guiding principles. Um, I think finally, what, what is preservation gonna look like because of them? 
you know, it remains to be seen, but I, what I would hope for uh, is that we will see a, you know, a field in, in five, 20, 50 years where, uh, you know, we, we have a more diverse group of people who believe that preservation is relevant to them. And when I say diverse, that includes all kinds of diversity, age, race, geography, um, you know, ex people with disabilities, um, our LGBTQ community, uh, people from outside of the preservation practice who see themselves as part of preservation or vice versa. Um, so I, I think the potential is, is significant and um, we don't know what it's going to look like, but certainly we have a direction and a roadmap now to try to get there. Um, I'm going to end and then open up Q&A just by asking you to help uh, support this work that we're doing. We hope that you're excited, uh, that you're intrigued, and that you will want to see us continue to implement, continue to innovate around this space. And we need your help to do that. We, we need your participation. Um, this is an opportunity to engage and also to support an organization, one of the many, uh, that is pushing the boundaries about what preservation is going to evolve to be in the future. So there are a number of ways that you can engage with us, everything from sharing our social media posts uh, to coming to events, uh, continuing to come to the Snapshots lecture and learn more. But you can deepen your involvement in many ways. Uh, you can participate in Giving Tuesday as you seek. Um, or hopefully somebody out there would consider sponsoring the Snapshots lecture so that we can provide it for free. And to provide it for free, we essentially need to pay for Zoom because it costs money, um, which is why we asked you to pay today. So please consider these options to, to support the innovative work of, uh, of the people of Landmarks Illinois. We are people saving places for people. And all of this work is about people and their connection to place. So I would like to thank those who are already supporting us, all of our members out there, our annual corporate sponsors and other donors. Thank you so much, our foundation partners uh, for ensuring this work is going forward. Um, so you can see our annual corporate sponsors right here, which um, provide us such a deep level of support for all of our programs. Um, finally, this is right here is my contact information in a number of different forms, and I hope that you will reach out um, in addition to right now with our Q&A, but as you think of these, feel free to send me more information. So with that, I'm going to take the, the PowerPoint off. Just know that you can find all, you can find all this information on our website uh, because I would like to be able to have you take your, your, um, uh, your camera off. Um, and uh, put your camera on so we can see you put yourself uh, off of mute um, and ask questions. So I believe we still have uh, about 14 minutes for our Q&A. And uh, Frank, you've been watching the chat. Is there anything that we can begin with as questions? There have, have not been people have been intently listening to you, Bonnie, and there is <laughs> not yet a question, but I, I, I know people are coming off of uh, uh, coming on camera. So I'd welcome anyone to, to, to jump in. Ah, thank you, everybody. This this is um, you know the a lot of information. Number one, uh, and it's um, it's it, it, these are areas that require deep thinking, and there aren't easy answers to them, and they can be in conflict. So we understand that it's taken us uh, eighteen months to think about them. So can't ask you in eighteen minutes to consider um, how you're going to present this. Any questions or thoughts? Uh, Sue Lannon, I see uh, you took yourself off mute, but we can't hear you. Were you trying to make a comment? Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, um, I heard about this Zoom link because of uh, the Rogers Park Women's Club building uh, in my neighborhood of Rogers Park. And I was wondering if Landmarks uh, Illinois is involved with that building in some way. Yes, uh, Sue, so we are absolutely, and I thankfully we have Lisa D. Kira, our director of advocacy, who has been leading that project. So, Lisa, would you like to talk about that project? Hi, Sue. I, it's it, it's um, not an ongoing project. It was an effort where we collaborated with the church congregation that is now the owner of the building. Um, like many. Uh, you know, owners of older buildings. Unfortunately, that congregation was given very bad advice by a contractor to rip out their historic windows. Um, you are well aware of that because it was um, 
posted on the Rogers Park neighborhood Facebook page and got a lot of traction that people were very upset that those historic windows had come out and that um, new vinyl windows were being uh, put in in their place. Uh, the older woman's office reached out to us to see if we could work with the church congregation to help them. We brought in our Skyline Council, our young professionals group to do um, a window assessment for the congregation, uh, which meant basically determining which windows that were still in place uh, were salvageable and could still be retained and repaired. Um, and then also those that had already come out and had been replaced by vinyl, if any of the old windows still existed um, and could still be swapped out again. Um, the congregation was wonderful to work with. They were very grateful for our assistance. Um, but we basically, you know, followed up giving them an extensive report of all of those windows recommendations on what they could do. And then really we leave it to them to proceed with what they felt they could do further. Um, and, you know, it, it, as you know, winter was upon them at that point and they had to close up, uh, you know, openings very quickly. So we have not heard from them lately to know what their next steps are, but we made it very clear we had grant funding as well and would be happy to help uh, going further. So, so if you want to communicate with me on this um, offline going further, I'm happy to do that as well. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, Bonnie, there's a question here about uh, uh, asking about sharing this presentation locally. So I think perhaps a question specific about this this recording, and then also wanting to engage in a, a, a conversation locally. And uh, would um, would there be any staff or board members available to participate? That comes from from Vicky. Thanks so much. Yeah. Hi, Vicki. Uh, thank you very much, our, our friends in Maywood, for being interested in having this conversation. And the presentation will be available on our YouTube page, Vicki, which you can link to from our website. If you go all the way to the bottom of the home page, you can there's a uh, you know a hot link to our YouTube page, and Caitlin will upload this in the future. Uh, so it will be there, um, you know, in the not too distant future. Uh, and you can show it from YouTube if you would like to. So that's where the recording will be located. As far as a follow-up conversation, absolutely. We would be happy to participate in that conversation with you and the other commissioners uh, and community members in preservation there. Um, and so you just let us know and we will find either a member of the, the think tank, the 50th anniversary task force or a member um, of the board or the staff who can participate with you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, so I was just going to say that I see, um, uh, I, you know, I see, for example, our, our partner, Matt Crawford, uh, from the, the city of Chicago, the um, uh, Department of Planning and Development here, which made me think about, I mean, there are numerous ways, I believe, we're going to implement these in ways that address those challenges that were on the, the two slides that I showed. You know, these, this needs to include a, a, a question, a, you know, evaluation, interrogation of our policies and preservation. Uh, you know, we're, we're not alone. The, the State Historic, National Conference of State Historic Preservation Officers, along with the National Park Service, have a joint task force to uh, evaluate the National Register of Historic Places right now. So I would like to tell you that's happening at the national level to look at that within the scope of how to increase the number of resources listed in the National Register that represent uh, diverse stories, untold stories, um, as well as, uh, you know, we, I think we have some work to do to consider how our incentives um, and regulations are being applied. So this, this will go to a policy level as well as we continue to, I think, um, you know, open, open the door to um, implementing them. Well, we certainly don't mind giving you a few, um, you know, a few moments back in your day if you want to take more time to think about this. Um, and we hope you'll you'll continue to consider them um, as well as see how they are being implemented. For example, at our uh, Landmarks Illinois Richard H. Street House Foundation Preservation Awards, um, I want to thank our jury. I know we have jury members, you know, who are participating today who did an excellent job of using the guiding principles as a lens to consider 
what our award winners uh, were going to look like, um, you know, who they benefited. So they use that as a filter. And you'll see these new ideas around preservation coming through in our uh, awards, for example. Um, so I hope that you will join us for that either at the Davis Theater on October 22nd or virtually um, at that program and that you'll come back on November 3rd for the conversation about Crystal Ray, uh, St. Martin College Prep and its reuse of uh, that former Kmart store. I mean, think about how many vacant uh, big box stores we have, how many vacant malls do we have or will we have? And uh, if we think about preservation as a sustainable practice, that's a lot of material out there for us to possibly reuse in ways that can be beneficial to a community. So I hope you'll continue to participate. Frank. Honey, I think uh, Lisa uh, Stone might have, was she trying to yeah, ask Lisa. a question? Yeah, I just, uh, um, I just wanted to congratulate you and your team on such an incredibly relevant and rigorous process that you've done that provides a model for, um, seasoned preservationists around the country and around the world, but especially for accidental preservationists and for, for students. So I look forward to sharing this video widely. And I've already shared your organizing principles with other kinds of organizations. So thank you. Oh, Lisa, thank you for that. We, we, um, we appreciate your um, you know, you're sharing this and, um, you know, the compliments to the large group of people who worked on this, you know, this has been an effort by, uh, you know, 40, 40 people at least uh, in doing this work. And I think that's a testament to, you know, how we work in community and collaboration here at Landmarks Illinois. So thank you for that. And I hope you'll continue to engage as, um, you know, as we move forward in doing this. So thank you. All right, everybody, I see we're at 12.55. Uh, so thank you so much, unless there are any final questions. I see, you know, thanks for the compliments um, to, you know, to the organization in the chat. We really appreciate that. Um, and keep an eye out for the, the continued work as we bring forward ideas, uh, more ideas for how we can evolve the preservation movement through uh, blog posts and the relevancy guidebook um, as well coming forward in the future. So other than that, thank you so much. I will stay on if anybody wants to, um, just to say, if you're, if you're not sure you want to ask your question in front of 30 people, um, I am going to stay on at, you know, until the bitter end if you want to stay and ask a private question. So other than that, thank you so much, everybody. Feel free to sign off and get five minutes back in your day. Thank you, Smitha. We see you. Nice to see you. Thanks, Frank, for your help on the, um, uh, the chat as well. Of course. All right. Thank you, friends. We see many of you here. You can feel free to sign off if you'd like to. Bob, Matt, Carol, Nate, Mary, Sharon, we know you all. Um, and so we, we thank you for staying to the bitter end. Uh, Sandra, Madam Chair, if there's anything that you want to contribute or say, please let us know. Otherwise, we're gonna we're gonna shut this down. Matt, did you have something? No, just was seeing if anybody else did. Just list, you know, lurking in the lurking in the lurking in the shadows of Zoom. <laughs> uh, we don't we don't mind you lurking, um, but do you you know do you have any?